Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to discuss two themes during my presentation. The first theme will be the emergence of primitive egalitarianism. Uh, just at the very beginning, I'd like to emphasize that I'm using the term emergence in a very loose sense. I just identified with the term coming into being, with the appearance, the origins. So I don't go into the details of uh, technical discussions about what emergence really means. Uh, and I would like to explain why I chose this topic. I think it's interesting for at least two reasons. The first reason is that uh, since human beings lived for a very long time uh, in egalitarian uh, societies, so it, will be, it can be regarded as a kind of original society structure of human beings, I think that the analysis of psychological underpinnings of egalitarianism may shed some light on the question of human political nature. So that's the first reason. The second reason is that uh, there is something of a riddle uh, in the fact that human beings live for so long in egalitarian societies because it's an exception in the uh, world of primates because the majority of primates, with some minor exceptions, like for instance squirrel monkeys, lived in hierarchical societies. So uh, the fact that egalitarianism is the basic st society structure of human beings, that the primitive uh, uh, society form, the, the form of bands and tribes were egalitarian, requires explanation, given that it's so unique in the world of primates. Mm -hmm. uh, so it'll be the basic topic of my presentation, but uh, one of the hypotheses which I will discuss that is supposed to explain uh, the emergence and the maintenance of primitive egalitarianism will have some uh, relevance also for the second question about the emergence, the emergence of uh, morality. So uh, these two problems of emergence will intersect in some point. I would like to develop, start distinguish two types of hypotheses which, are, uh, which can be adduced to explain the emergence of uh, egalitarianism. Uh, the first type of hypotheses are those which assume that the human mind is a blank slate with respect to political behavior, and the second type of hypothesis assume that human, the human mind is not a blank slate with respect to political behavior, and I would like to explain why I reject the first type of hypothesis. Mm, I think there are two reasons. The first reason is that in light of evolutionary theory, it's not convincing to maintain that the human mind is a blank slate uh, to cool, so it's not a blank slate also with respect to political behavior. Well, that's a very general reason, so perhaps it may not be convincing for everyone. I think that the second reason is more interesting. The second reason is that the purely economic or social hypothesis explaining the, the maintenance of egalitarianism uh, seem to be insufficient. Such uh, hypotheses are, for, as, as for instance those which point at demographic instability, nomadic restraints and material accumulation, the absence of economic specialization outside the family or uncentralized redistribution systems for me as causes of primitive egalitarianism. They are insufficient for a very simple reason. Now, these uh, hypotheses are forager specific, so they are good at explaining uh, the emergence and maintenance of egalitarianism in bands, in forager societies, but they are not good at explaining mm, the fact that also tribes which do not fulfill all those conditions enumerated before, also are also egalitarian. So the fact that those ecologically and socially different society structures like bands and tribes mm, have an egalitarian system requires a more general explanation than those specific hypotheses. But it's, it's, undoubt, it's undoubtedly true that mm, all those factors which uh, those hypotheses uh, invoke mm, contribute to an egalitarian way of life, but they are simply not sufficient. The first hypothesis which I'd like to briefly mention and reject for very obvious reasons is a hypothesis which assumes that human beings are by nature egalitarian. So this natural propensity which explains the egalitarian structure of human societies is simply the existence of purely egalitarian propensities in human nature. This hypothesis implies that the primitive egalitarianism is a direct expression of human nature and the collapse of the egalitarianism and the transition to despotic hierarchical societies can only be explained by external factors, the invention of private property or agriculture. But there are two basic reasons for the rejections of this hypothesis. The first one is that simply uh, it's unintuitive because it denies the existence of hierarchical propensities in human nature. The second one is that it was, uh, I think, efficiently demolished by uh, ethologists and anthropologists. I think that a special role in demolishing this hypothesis was played by Mm, and the famous German ethologist Irenaeus Abel Ibersfeld, who simply demolished the myth of peaceful mm, egalitarian societies. Simply, this hypothesis implies that mm, egalitarian societies are free from any inner tensions, which is simply not true. Mm, so I would like to pass to other hypotheses of the second type. 
And the second hypothesis I would like to consider um, is the hypothesis which seems more interesting. It was, uh, it was proposed and developed in great detail by uh, a great German social psychologist, Helmut Scheck, and which was also hinted at by Freud in his uh, famous article, Group Psychology and Analysis of Ego. Um, and this hypothesis simply assumed that human being is homo invidioso, so the basic um, and predominant social emotion of human beings is uh, envy, and here we have some kind of tentative definition of envy. Um, and uh, Scheck makes a very careful uh, description of the maintenance of egalitarian societies in terms of envy. He invokes envy to explain the maintenance of, and the emergence of the maintenance of egalitarian societies. Um, and he he points at such fact that, for instance, uh, envy uh, uh, enables social control, and thereby it enables uh, because it enables because it, it generates conformity. So people simply fear other people's envy, and this fear of other people's envy is a kind of uh, uh, mm, uh, is a reason for 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 uh, for uh, manifesting egalitarian behavior. Uh, besides. Mm, uh, uh, Sheg also uh, emphasizes the fact um, that envy can be invoked as an explanatory factor uh, of the fact that uh, uh, that uh, egalitarian societies uh, were not very innovative because envy in his view was a kind of barrier to social innovation so uh, by explaining the fact of the lack of innovation in egalitarian societies envy is also according to um, Sheg able to explain the static character of the societies. Interestingly, uh, this uh, hypothesis is not mm, uh, helpless uh, in dealing with the problem of the existence of hierarchical despotic societies. Because uh, mm, one of the features of envy which is emphasized by Helmut Scheck mm, is the fact that it's sensitive to social proximity. So we exhibit envy only to, per to persons who mm, are socially, uh, physically and mentally close to us. So if there are astounding inequalities in a given society, then this envy simply will not be uh, mm, uh, an obstacle for the maintenance of such a society. Mm, I think that this uh, uh, hypothesis is very insightful, but I think it's very one-sided, so it simply neglects the existence of many other uh, mm, important elements of human political nature. And now I would like to pass to a hypothesis which uh, seems to me and especially interesting, and I'd like to put it to a more careful analysis of the two preceding hypotheses. And the hypothesis I'd like to consider in more detail is the hypothesis which was proposed by a very famous uh, evolutionary anthropo anthropologist, Christopher Benn, and it was developed uh, in great detail by him in two books, uh, Hierarchy in the Forest and the Moral Regions. And the Hypothesis assumes that human being is homo hierarchicus, so human beings have been endowed by natural selection with hierarchical propensities, a drive to dominance and aversion to domination, not egalitarian ones, but what's interesting and what is striking, uh, this, uh, uh, these tendencies, in conjunction, in conjunction with instrumental rationality and the capacity for symbolic thinking, lead to egalitarianism. So this is a very austere hypothesis. It assumes that we only have to assume the existence of, mm, mm, of the hierarchical propensities of human nature, and if we add to those, those typically human abilities, like instrumental rationality and capacity for symbolic thinking, we can explain the emergence and the maintenance of egalitarianism. Mm, uh, uh, in more detail, what is the role of instrumental rationality according to Bem in explaining uh, uh, the functioning of uh, uh, the maintenance and the emergence of uh, the, the emergence and the maintenance of of, uh, mm. of egalitarian structures? His reasoning is very simple. Uh, according to this hypothesis, each e agent is hierarchical, but since, but since each agent realizes that his chance of being at the top of social hierarchy is low, he prefers to live in an egalitarian society. Uh, in, in words of the economic uh, anthropologist Harold Schneider, all men seek to rule, but if they cannot rule, they prefer to remain equal. So the choice of an egalitarian society is simply instrumentally rational. Most agencies have this kind of preference ordering, uh, to dominate, to be equal, to submit to alpha, to fight with alpha and to lose. Uh, and given the low probability of being at the top of the social hierarchy, people simply to prefer to choose the second best uh, option. So this is the role of instrumental rationality. 
Uh, and what is the role of the capacity for symbolic thinking? Uh, simply, uh, according to Bem, and it's a very interesting hypothesis, simply the capacity for symbolic thinking is what enables uh, uh, those people who come to the conclusion that egalitarian society is a better option to achieve this option. So the setting up of an egalitarian society was made possible by human symbolic capacities which enable human beings to create a moral community and thereby to create some kind of major coalition which was directed against the would-be alphas of the society mm, and thereby oppose those individuals with despotic proclivities constituting a constant threat to an egalitarian society. So simply according to Ben, without the specific symbolic capacities of human beings, it would be impossible to create uh, some kind of intentional community which would be able to oppose those uh, would-be alphas, those people with despotic, uh, with despotic uh, proclivities. So this is the core of Bem's hypothesis, and now let me uh, provide some perhaps illuminating other details uh, connected with this, uh, with this hypothesis. Um, uh, the first, in Bem's view, it's not the case that egalitarian society, primitive societies lacked any kind of social hierarchy. His point is that this hierarchy was just reversed. It's of course a simple consequence of the core of his hypothesis. At the top of this hierarchy there are the rank and file, whose power lies in their capacity to act together against the alphas. And at the bottom there are those would be alphas. So calling this kind of structure uh, reverse dominance hierarchy is just a simple consequence and some kind of requirement of consistency of these basic assumptions that human beings are, as far as the political nature is concerned, uh, homines hierarchies. See. Uh, at the second uh, point, historical predecessors. Of course, uh, the, a similar kind of reasoning can be found first in Calicles, uh, the, the, the pupil of the famous uh, sophist Gorgias. Of course, Nietzsche is developing a very similar hypothesis. Uh, uh, Freud and Totten and Stabel, uh, alluding to Tar Darwin in turn, also is uh, developing a similar hypothesis. And also, uh, the French anthropologist uh, René Girard. Uh, one can find some similarities be between his view of the origins of human culture and this Ben's reasoning, because of course there are also very many differences. At any rate, I think that uh, mm, uh, the advantage of Ben's approach is that it's simply uh, mm, the most contem contemporary, it simply draws on the achievements of evolutionary theory, anthropology, etology. Uh, and now I'd like to pass to the point uh, in which the two problems of emergence, which I mentioned at the very beginning, intersect. The problem of the emergence of egalitarianism, the problem of the emergence of, uh, of uh, morality. Because I think that the most uh, striking uh, feature of, and the most striking uh, element of, of, uh, mm, of uh, Ben's hypothesis is, is his claim that uh, primitive egalitarianism uh, could have played a role in evolution uh, of, a of, a, of a mechanism facilitating the selection of altruistic terms. So egalitarianism was a kind of selective pressure which contributed to the development of altruistic uh, traits. It's a very striking hypothesis. It was not uh, 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 advanced by another thinking bef before him. Um, of course, this, the, his, his core claim is, was, was, was anticipated by many thinkers, but his thesis about the role of egalitarianism as a selective pressure is, 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 is decidedly novel. And how he develops this claim in detail? He develops it in, in two ways. First, he says that uh, uh, primitive egalitarianism created a kind of selective pressure, which could have functioned at two levels, at the individual level and at the group level. So he's oscillating between uh, individual uh, uh, selection at the individual level and, uh, and the idea that uh, the, uh, the evolution um, uh, operated at the group level. How could it have played, how, how could it have functioned at the individual level? He's speaking about social selection uh, uh, operated by those egalitarian societies. Uh, and the social selection was uh, of two types. It was selection by reputation and the punitive selection, which was aimed at eliminating bullies and, and, and free riders. So all those individuals who constituted a threat to the functioning of, uh, of egalitarian society. Uh, interestingly, this hypothesis, if it were true, would show that, uh, uh, that uh, natural selection was not a purely blind process, because at some stage of the evolution of uh, Homo sapiens, 
um, uh, social intentions of hunter-gatherers unwittingly affected the gene pool in the direction of greater altruism. So it's a very interesting hypothesis. Uh, how, it's, how could it have functioned at the group level? In a very simple way. Uh, because egalitarianism increases, de decreases the within group selection, ipso facto increases group selection, the possibility of group selection. So because, it because egalitarianism reduces the fundamental variation within groups, it simply sharpens the differences between group uh, uh, between groups, and thereby it can contribute to the functioning of uh, the functioning of group selection. But interestingly, in his second book, Ben withdraws from the um, hypothesis that group selection could have played a role in the evolution of altruistic terms. He's focusing more on this first uh, um, on the on this first level of, of, of selection. So that's the first way in which these two hypotheses about the emergence uh, intersect. But there's also an interesting second way in which egalitarianism um, could have played a role in the emergence of, uh, of morality. Uh, and this way is as follows. According to, according to them, um, uh, primitive egalitarianism uh, could have contributed to the, to the emergence of human conscience. Uh, he puts forward this hypothesis in direct opposition to Charles Darwin, who maintained that uh, human consciousness is a side effect of human intellectual capacities and <laughs> social, social instincts. So according to Darwin, human consciousness is not a biological ad adaptation. Contrary to this view, Ben maintains that human consciousness is a biological adaptation. It's, it evolved for a specific reason, simply as a means of self-control, enabling agents to avoid group punishment for bullying or cheating behavior. So those individuals were better at inhibiting their antisocial tendencies and they were better at avoiding uh, those uh, means of social control which these egalitarian groups had at their disposal had the fitness advantage over those who manifested them openly. Uh, of course, this hypothesis is very controversial but it has interesting consequences. It assumes, it, it leads to the conclusion that the optimal evolutionary conscience is not a perfect mechanism in, uh, of uh, real internalization that makes some inhibition, so to say, automatic. Simply, the, hum the, perfect, the optimal human conscience would be, according to this hypothesis, somewhat loose, would take advantage of some uh, exceptions where possible. So, so it would not be a human conscience in this, uh, in this traditional sense, it would be some kind of loser human conscience. And now let me pass to critical remarks on Bem's hypothesis. I think that Bem's account is overly reductionist. It seems that human political nature is not uh, univalent but ambivalent. Simply, I find it unconvincing uh, that uh, I find unconvincing uh, Bem's claim that uh, the, the description of human political nature is exhausted by uh, by invoking only those hierarchical propensities. Interestingly, I think that Bem's himself oscillates between this reductionist view of human political nature, which is trying to explain the structure of egalitarian societies in terms of hierarchical propensities, and uh, a more um, ambivalent view, because he's himself using the term ambivalent sometimes, I think unwittingly, but more interestingly, uh, in arguing for his hypothesis about the psychological forces uh, supporting egalitarianism, that appeals to the research on the ultimatum game. Uh, and this research, research, as is well known, shows that the rejection of unfair offers can be explained more plausibly by, 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 uh, by assuming the existence of some kind of aversion to inequality in human nature. But of course, this experiment doesn't support uh, mm, uh, Bem's hypothesis in its pure form, because it's an argument for, uh, for assuming that, apart from those hierarchical propensities, human nature also contains some type of egalitarian propensities. So the argument which Ben invokes in his own book simply is an argument against his own hypothesis. At least I understand it in this way. Uh, what are the problems with Ben's account of the emergence of morality? Uh, I think that the main problem is the following. Uh, if we assume, as Ben does, that fully developed human symbolic capacities were necessary for the maintenance of uh, uh, egalitarianism, and if we assume, as evolutionary theory, theory teaches us, that those fully developed symbolic capacities developed more or less 50 or 40,000 years before Christ, and that from that time on uh, the human gene pool 
did not change considerably, there is simply no time for those egalitarian structures to uh, exert an influence on the gene pool, to affect the gene pool in the way suggested and described by Ben. Of course, Ben could save uh, his claim by weakening uh, his claim, his, his, his thesis that fully developed symbolic capacities were necessary for, for, uh, for uh, the maintenance and for the emergence of egalitarian society. Uh, and I think that this is a way which would be um, that would be best possible response to this to this to this objection, because I think because I find this hypothesis of Ben that egalitarianism may have had may have shaped the human gene pool in the direction of great altruism convincing, but of course it's incompatible with this uh, hypothesis about the necessity of, uh, of, of, symbolic, of fully developed symbolic capacities. So I think that in order to harmonize those hypotheses, he should, he should, he should simply, he should, he should simply um, uh, weaken uh, this claim about, uh, this strong claim about the necessity of this fully developed symbolic capacities for, for the development of, uh, of egalitarian society. As for the story about the uh, origins of conscience, it's just so storied. It sounds plausible, but of course it's just so storied that one can invent many uh, other ones in order to, 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 to argue for uh, the claim that conscience is a biological adaptation. But of course we can stop uh, with uh, Darwin and assume that conscience is not a biological adaptation, but it's just an exaptation. So let me summarize briefly. What's wrong? It's, I'm not, it's, perhaps it's too strong to say what's wrong, but what seems to me wrong with hypothesis one through three. Uh, hypothesis one, this hypothesis of Rousseau, Engels, from his book about the origins of family, property, and the state, uh, is naive. Simply, human beings are by nature egalitarian. One cannot say so, given the achievements of ethology and anthropology and so on. Hypothesis. Two and three, so Sheck's hypothesis and Bem's hypothesis, seem to me to dismal. I think that they uh, assume an impossible separation of political nature and moral nature in the sense that they assume that human political nature is simply amoral because, you know, because it's reduced only to hierarchical propensities. Any kind of uh, egalitarian propensities, propensities are excluded from, from, this, uh, from the description of, the pol of human political nature. But as far as Bem's, Bem's hypothesis is concerned, I would like to repeat what I have said before, that his claim that egalitarianism created a selective pressure for the emergence and, and or development of altruistic terms seems plausible. It's, it's, it's a very interesting hypothesis novel. It's a hypothesis just marginally, which is, uh, uh, which is competitive with those traditional accounts of the emergence of altruistic terms, which uh, appeal to kin selection, to reciprocal altruism, or to also group selection in, in a different form than, 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 than BAM. So I think we should uh, go in search of a hypothesis which is neither naive nor too dismal, and now I will, uh, I will engage in, in total speculation, because I, it will be speculation not supported by, by, by any empirical research, but just by some kind of intuition and by reference to the history of, of, of moral thinking, so to say. So I would like to propose the fourth hypothesis, which will not be naive, I hope, and not too dismal. Mm, and the hypothesis I would like to call the aversion to hybrids hypothesis. And the hypothesis uh, assumes some elements of the former hypothesis and adds something new. The hypothesis assumes that human beings, which is hard to deny in the light of evolutionary theory, have, have been endowed by natural selection with hierarchical propensities, uh, drive to dominance and aversion to being dominated, and envious propensities. So these are elements from Shakes and Bem's theory. But the, but the above mentioned propensities do not exhaust the description of their political nature. Human beings have also been endowed by natural selection with or have developed as a, as a result of their cognitive capacities. That's a great riddle. Uh, which, what is um, a result, a direct result of natural selection and what is some kind of side effect? With the aversion to hybrids, which played an important role in supporting egalitarianism. So I think that the aversion to hybrids is just the hypothesis and some kind of primitive, elementary moral intuition which underlies other moral intuitions and which has connection with human political nature and with the maintenance of egalitarianism. <coughs> and this hypothesis doesn't separate political nature and moral nature because aversion to hybrids is both a part of political nature and of moral nature. Now, in more detail. 
Mm, uh, what is hybris? Just to recall. Uh, hybris is variously defined by self-confidence, bordering on arrogance, insolence, overbearing pride, self aggrandizement the belief in one's own superiority over other persons and one's having special rights and privileges flowing from this purported superiority. So, <coughs> Hebrews implies a denial of moral equality of human beings. And I would suggest that the aversion to Hebrews is this primitive moral intuition, that we are simply, basically and first and foremost, sensitive to this kind of immoral behavior. And this kind of intuition can be confirmed by the fact, or supported by the fact, that in various moral traditions, for instance, in the Greek thought, Hebrews is considered to be the gravest moral transgression and the source of other, all other moral uh, transgressions. So it's, uh, it's treated as a kind of uh, peccatum originale. Interestingly, uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was described in great detail by Aristotle in his rhetoric, who maintained that a typical manifestation of Hebrews uh, is the deliberate humiliation of the other, the deliberate infliction of shame on the other for no other reasons than the pleasure involved. So, Hebrews manifests itself in pure form when one gives offense neither for profit nor in revenge but simply because one delights in inflicting shame on others. So Hebristic behavior is simply something which uh, goes in direct opposition to this egalitarian ethos which was, which was postulated by, 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 by Ben. Hebristic meditation in Greece, this digression is not necessary. Mm, uh, a great uh, classical philologist, uh, Paul Woodruff, wrote a very nice book about uh, the virtue of reverence, which in his view is the opposite of Hebrews. He's, trying, he's making a very careful analysis of reverence and Hebrews, showing that reverence is this kind of virtue which is, which is the opposite of Hebrews. And what a version of Hebrews is not. Uh, uh, Sheck devoted some attention to Hebrews in his book about envy, but uh, I think that he defined, he understood Hebrews in a bad way, because he maintained that Hebrews uh, elicits envy. Uh, of course, he was trying to explain everything in terms of envy, so also he believed that uh, Hebrews elicits envy. But this suggests a direction to Hebrews is not moral indignation. So we don't have aversion to Hebrews being a certain moral phenomenon, but the regret of not being able to occupy the place of the Hebristic person. So this suggestion doesn't seem plausible. I think that the main reason for the aversion to Hebrews seems to be moral. We object to Hebrews because we deem it morally outrageous, not, be, not because we would like ourselves to be in the place of the Hebristic man. Of course, the aversion to Hebrews displays some hypothesis, displays some similarity to Hegel's account of the role of human desire for recognition in social evolution. But the difference between these two is, of course, uh, obvious, because aversion to Hebrews is, as I understand it, and it's a moral feeling, whereas the desire for recognition and the concomitant aversion to people who refuse to grant us such a recognition is non moral. So the difference is basic. And now, Mm -hmm. I would like to generalize. The aversion to Hebrews hypothesis differs from hypothesis 1 and hypothesis, uh, hypothesis 2 and hypothesis 3, Shag and Ben, in that it assumes the existence of a genuinely egalitarian propensity in human nature. So this is this aversion to Hebrews. This is this egalitarian propensity. And in this point it agrees with hypothesis 1. It differs from hypothesis 1 uh, and agrees with hypothesis 2 and hypothesis 3 in that it assumes also the existence of hierarchical and envious propensities in human nature. So it, I would call it the truly ambivalent of human political nature because it assumes the existence of those, so, so to say, good and bad elements in human political nature. And final remarks. Uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, we know, so to say, externally what primitive egalitarianism is, but those four hypotheses uh, imply different, so to say, inner view of egalitarianism. So, hypothesis one implies what is called, or what may be called, relaxed uh, egalitarianism. Uh, because it denies the presence of hierarchical proclivities of human nature. So there are simply no inner tensions in egalitarian society. In, in this case, it implies that uh, egalitarian societies are relaxed, whereas the remaining uh, hypotheses imply what is called tense egalitarianism. A form of egalitarianism requires <coughs> constant vigilance and uh, often harsh, harsh sanctions towards its members to counteract the dominant tendencies of potential alphas, upstarts, bullies, aggressors. Uh, furthermore, <coughs> and finally, hypothesis one, interestingly, implies that, that human egalitarianism is a direct expression of our egalitarian propensities and thereby doesn't require egalitarian communities to be regarded as the product of human intentionality. So, 
uh, this hypothesis implies that, for instance, human beings' egalitarianism is quite similar to the egalitarianism of squirrel monkeys. In the sense that it's just an expression of certain in, uh, egalitarian instincts, it's not the product of, of some kind of social invention. Uh, whereas the remaining hypothesis uh, from 2 to 4 implies that egalitarianism cannot be just an expression of our egalitarian propensities because human, being, human political nature comprises also other propensities, hierarchical and propensities, apart from those egalitarian uh, ones. Thank you for your attention.